Hey, so I'm going to just make sure this is working because I always am terrified that you can't hear me, you can't see me, or, or something's going on because I'm not as familiar with live on YouTube as I am on everywhere else. So uh, we are going to do a little rapid fire session today. I've got about 11. Hey, Gustavus, Gustavus, is that right? Can you hear me? Um, I've got about 11 questions to answer for you guys, and uh, if you have questions as we're going along, by all means, post them, and I will answer them there as well as we're going. I'm going to limit this to about 30 minutes because I do have to get to a graveside, actually, um, so I have to work. Okay, I am... I want to just make sure I can read comments. So, what happens when the ground is frozen and you need to bury? So, um, in some parts, well, I'm in Michigan. So, northern Michigan, this happens more often. Or you get into Canada or, you know, North Dakotas or, or anywhere like that. Um, the ground is going to freeze during the winter. Now, some winters, it's not as bad because you get a... Uh, the snow before the ground freezes and it actually insulates the ground so you don't have to worry about busting on through. However, if the ground is too frozen to, hey guys, it's to get into the ground, they do have like dynamite options where you can pay for them to bust into the ground. You can do storage for the winter. Um, sometimes they have this option so I printed off a little picture so you guys can see. So there's a little covering that goes over the grave and it's heated and so it creates, I don't know, almost like a steam effect to thaw the ground so that they can dig. Um, some cemeteries before the ground thaws will dig huge holes, like a national cemetery they've done this where they dig um, huge holes and that way they can, um, and they fill it with a wood chips and so then in the winter they just remove the wood chips and then bury so it's a little bit easier process for them because like at a national cemetery where they're burying hundreds of bodies over the winter they um they can't just store them all so when you do store you literally just put someone into storage their whole casket everything seal them up put them into storage and then sometimes the bodies view them in the spring before burial if they're able to sometimes you do have to remove a little mold or um, clean them up or recosmetize but I've done that where I've, I've had the person put in storage and then um, taken them and, and then buried them so uh, I'm just making notes as I'm going to make sure I can get to everybody's questions hopefully um, so yeah so sometimes you store sometimes you bury hopefully the family can see the person again before you bury in the spring Sometimes it's not even the frozen ground that's the issue, it is the snow. Because if there's a large amount of snow, you have to put it somewhere in the cemetery so you run out of parking, you run out of accessibility to even get to the graves. So I've run into more winters where we actually just can't get into the cemetery because of the snow, not so much the frozen ground. Number two, do you put perfume or cologne on the bodies? Not as often as you would think, actually. Like, to me, that's a natural, I would bring in something so that they smelled like my loved one. Uh, but most people don't bring something in. I try to, with babies, put baby lotion and powder on the baby so that they smell a little more. Um, yeah, Sherry, so you know about the, the holding of the body. Uh, so that they smell a little more like a, a baby. Um, if the person's been autopsied, there's a very distinct smell to them. And then, you're welcome, Mark. And so then um, I'll often recommend to someone that they, bear, they bring in cologne or perfume that we can spray around just to mask the odor a little bit. So, okay. Where do you store the bodies? A basement or uh, a garage? facility if you don't have room sometimes you can rent space that you would store the body in a locked facility are there bodies you can't embalm okay 
So David asked, have I buried a notorious criminal? So David actually made me a Facebook or a YouTube video to ask me this question, which I'm not joking. My husband thought I was crazy because I was like, someone made me a video. Like that's seriously, David, that was amazing. So he wondered if I very ever buried a notorious kind of criminal and how I felt about this. So like if Timothy McVeigh or the Sandy Hook shooter, somebody like that, um, you know, came across my table essentially. So this discussion came up not too long ago when Charles Manson died within industry like Facebook groups and people were saying, would you care for him? Would you care for him? And it came down to a huge ethical, this is our job and we should care for whoever we're called upon to care for. And so a lot of people and most people had that thought. Some people said, no way. Morally, I cannot care for that person because of how evil they are. However, this came into play back when there was the Boston bombings that the gentleman, one of the bombers, um, because of religious beliefs, needed to be buried. And nobody would help. Nobody would take care of his body because of the situation. Eventually, a funeral home stepped forward and cared for him. It was a huge thing because everybody was turning this family away, which was, in my opinion, crap. So here is my thought. You're not caring for the evil, for the deceased, for who died essentially. You're caring for the family. It doesn't matter if it is Charles Manson or whoever it may be. They have family that loved them. At one point, this evil person was a child that was raised by a parent that loved them. In a lot of situations, sometimes no. But was a child and they were, you know, carefree and, and kind and, you know, they were loved by someone. And so um, you're doing the services for those people. Those people need support too. They're, they've lost somebody during this situation. I think about like Columbine where the shooters, you know, died and their families had to essentially in private have these services. So they could not get the support and the love that they needed because of all the media, because of the backlash, because of everything that was going on. And so in, in secret, they had to bury their sons. They lost children too. And just because their children were evil doesn't make them any less of parents, doesn't make the parents love their child any less in that moment. They still had loss. So that's how I view it. Um, I have taking care of pedophiles and, you know, some pretty nasty people. Nothing of the, you know, Timothy McVeigh in magnitude, but some pretty nasty people, and I don't focus on them. I focus on the family. Um, strangest requests. Um, I have done a video on requests that people put in the casket. So, um, um, I haven't had a lot of crazy, you know, thongs on on people dressing them. Nothing too crazy, you know, things that are too low cut or strapless dresses, things that we accommodate or make recommendations for something different. I did have a request for someone to be naked and we kind of changed the person's mind, but the woman said, "That's how I liked him best, so that's really how I want him." Um I've done a child, we had the visitation, the child was in their own bed at the visitation so that, you know, kids could walk up and be at the level of the, the child that when they came in. Um, but I've never had like the extreme posing where somebody's on their motorcycle or things like that. That's more, um, there's a very specific funeral homes that um, do that often. And so they kind of have figured out the structuring and, and how to do that easily. Well, not easily, but um, they figured out some of the tricks of the trade for that. That's one thing I would love to do is go visit one of those places and see kind of how they do some of that. Would you like to own and supervise your own funeral home someday? No, I have no interest. I, I, I'm not a business person per se. I don't like the business side of things. There's too many politics and too much worry on is this bill going to be paid and is this going to happen? Um, so to own a, a large business or, you know, a, a brick and mortar type thing is just not for me. I like the freedom of where I'm at right now to do the freelance and the trade work. And, you know, one day when my kids are grown, maybe I will go back into the business in terms of a 
full time day to day and and things. But I, I'm kind of just seeing where life takes me right now. You know, God has a plan for me, and I'm I'm following what I think is is what He's putting before me. Ha, uh, Larry asked, "Have I ever gone through burnout?" I don't think large, um, lengthy times of burnout, but I would say definitely some days that I I'm totally not in it. Like I'm there. And I'm at my desk or I'm meeting with a family and my head's just not totally in it. And I don't love myself those days because I am not caring for the family at 110%. And when I care for a family, I like to be at 110%, but sometimes you don't. Um, I went through, I would say, I guess, a little bit longer phase of that when I was, um, I had postpartum with one of my children bad and... I was so numb some days where I, I wasn't as emotionally entwined as I sometimes can get at the funeral home. So I would say it wasn't as much burnout as it was just not in it. In it to win it, I guess you would say. Um, is it true if you get a deceased soon enough after death and you go to cut the vein in their neck, they'll pop up on the examining table because their nervous system isn't completely dead? No. <laughs> Simple. No. Um, Ed, I don't understand your question. When did you know you wanted to be a funeral director? I, I have a whole video on this. Um, essentially, I was about one or two weeks into my apprenticeship, and I was trying it. I didn't really know at that point, and I was one or two weeks in, and I worked with a family of a child that um, she had died after open heart surgery. She had had multiple open heart surgeries, complications. Just a lot of health issues, and I was working with a mom. It was just her and I with the little girl, and we were getting her ready and getting things set up, and I was putting some rings on her fingers, and it was just it. That was my, I, I would say that was probably my moment where I was like, this is what I was meant to do kind of thing. Um, I'm comfortable. I'm giving back. I'm helping people. This is not creeping me out. So I, I kind of knew at that moment, and there's been, I think, a lot of those moments over time, but that was maybe the first one that I would say I had when it came to funeral directing. When it came to embalming, I remember standing and being shown this gentleman's head who had shot him through the head and the other funeral director I was working with um, was showing me where the exit wounds were and I couldn't see them. And I knew then I really wanted to know how to do that. Like I wanted that, I wanted to be able to do that for a family. So that was maybe my embalming moment that I, I kind of knew I wanted in on, on all of that. Glenn, how do you know the body is fully cremated? What happens if the body is not fully cremated? Does the chamber have a window so they can check? Um, there's no window. You just open and can peek in. And you the, the machine has a timer on it that's set for... Um, the size and so forth and so you kind of set the machine up to run as long as it needs to and then at the end you know typically the person is fully cremated the only thing would be if, if the heat didn't get to a specific area and that part may not be done and then you do a longer burn but typically that doesn't happen yes you also asked if a larger person takes longer to cremate you must start a larger person on in a cold oven so typically in the morning and somebody has to tend to that machine during the duration. Because as soon as the flame catches to the fat, the fat acts as gasoline or um, you know, a grease fire. Essentially, you have to turn the machine off and that fat burns the body down itself. So the machine's not actually running, it's the, the body burning itself down. And once you burn down to a certain point, then you turn the machine back on and kind of keep doing that process or else you can get a huge grease fire. If that liquid all runs out of the machine, you can have a grease fire on the floor or burn down a whole facility, which has happened. So it is very dangerous and it takes a lot of time and effort for a larger person to be cremated. Um, just went to the open house this weekend at CCMS. Guess where I went? Um, yeah, I need to go back and visit there. I haven't been there in a couple years. Are people allowed, Wes asked, to visit cemeteries and just walk around? So taphophilia is a thing and it is people who are intrigued by and enjoy going to cemeteries and it's not a creepy thing it's people who like to go enjoy the beauty of the the carving and the structures and read the epitaphs and um i call them cemetery enthusiasts cemetery tourists grave hunters a person who has a passion for and enjoyment of cemeteries epitaphs 
gravestones, rubbings, photographs, history, art. There's so much to see in a cemetery. Um, there's several cemeteries around that are, they're so big. And a lot of walkers will go there because it's much safer than being on the public roadway to go and to walk and to get exercise or walk your animals as long as you pick up after them. You know, if you see a, a gravesite happening, avoid walking in that area or pay respect, stop, whatever you may want to do. Don't um, be disrespectful in that essence. But no, people are not going to think you're crazy if you want to go walk through a cemetery. Have you ever had bodies come to life? No. And this has been a big question lately, and I'm not sure why. I It's kind of like the um, embalming a pregnant woman. I've gotten the question so many times that I don't know if maybe I've missed a news story about it or something because there's so many people asking me about has somebody come to life. Um, so it's, it's definitely interesting. Uh, no, I've never, I don't know anybody who it has happened to. I, I think some of that more has happened, and you read it in the news story, that it's in, like, I, I don't want to say third world countries, but countries that maybe don't have the overseeing of the hospice workers and the doctors and the medical facilities. And so somebody dies at home, and they're declared dead, and by the time they get to the medical professionals, they're not truly dead. And so I think um, in that instance, it, it happens. Okay, Michael, you're asking me, what are your thoughts on Caitlin? Yep, that's my next up question, actually. I, that's, I just finished with my ones. Okay, so everybody does ask me about Caitlin and what my thoughts are on her. Caitlin has a very distinct, you know, opinion on the death care business. And she is anti-embalming and is very proactive about that. And that's great for her. I believe in options just like she does, you know, just because I embalm doesn't mean I am anti-green burial or anti-home burial or home funerals. We just don't have that in our area yet. She's out at the coast where that's more predominant. And so she encounters that a lot more out there. There's nowhere here that facilitates that at, um, at such a, a level that, that they do out there. Um, I think her knowledge on the history of death care in the business is phenomenal. That's one reason I would watch some of her videos is for that information. You know, rather than going and Googling something, she has consolidated some of that information into very distinct videos, which is awesome. So, um, yeah, I don't have anything against her. She definitely is a, a turd stirrer when it comes to the business. And a lot of people in the business dislike her because she has talked so aggressively against embalming and I think she's kind of the Jessica Mitford essentially of this generation where she does talk negatively about it and that's fine I opinions are great you know I have my opinion on things but just because I do something doesn't mean I'm anti something else um do headless bodies creep me out anytime a body is in positioning that it's not supposed to be. So like long bone donor bodies, so when the leg bones are all removed and so there's just skin from the hip down to the foot and then there's this foot kind of just there, that creeps me out. So if a body has no head, that's gonna be weird, it's creepy. I don't know if creepy is the right word, it's just unsettling, I guess. You know, when an arm is broken and there's a bone sticking out, that to me is, is just unsettling um but I also don't like colostomy bags and I don't and it's nothing against people with colostomies but it's just unsettling to me I guess is the best word for it so um can you be buried naked yep um have I ever dropped a body one time I did not drop somebody but it was the slowest motion he was on a table and his arm slid off of him and it was enough counterweight to pull him off the table and he didn't like roll and thud it was like the sliding movement off of the table onto the floor and I was like what do I do and so and to get somebody off the floor it's kind of hard so I grabbed another director and we we got him up on off the floor so luckily it wasn't a big thud it wasn't a big huge fall um never had a casket tip over 
with somebody in it. Um, yeah. Professional tire for an aspiring funeral director or advice on starting a good funeral home wardrobe. Um, check out my how to dress as a female in the business video. So no boobies. Um, not going to be showing some boobies today. Sorry. Oh, um, bodies. I went last year and prearranged my funeral. I'm going to be buried in a cemetery. I think it's great to go prearrange a funeral. I am so, um, I'm so pro getting ahead of things and getting things in place for yourself. No body sitting up in the funeral home. They can't. There's, it's physically impossible. Like 99.9. .9. I'm never going to say 100% because I think that's a pretty um, adamant answer to anything. So how often do you do military funerals and do you have someone in your staff who is knowledgeable in the military funeral procession? I would say um, I don't work in one funeral home. I work in multiple as a freelance funeral director. So um, I have done actually a lot of gravesides lately because I go to the National Cemetery a lot. Um, it's, you don't have to have one person on your staff that's super knowledgeable. And it can be many people or people that are around it a lot. It doesn't have to be kind of like Catholic service. You don't need Catholic to know a lot about it. Um, I can play Catholic better than some Catholics, I feel like, some days. Because I, I know the, the stuff and, and, and can do it. And there's people who in the military who don't know how a, a burial for military actually happens. So um, I would say it comes, comes in streaks. It used to be a lot more when, because there for a while, about um, between 5 to 10 years ago, it was like 1,400 people a day were dying that were veterans from World War II. That's now, of course, um, decreased because there's not as many veterans from World War II, but there are. There's a lot of veterans dying, and we're into the generation where the Vietnam um, era, where a lot of them are saying, yeah, I don't know that I want the honors because of the reception they received. So they had such a negative connection to it that they don't want the honors like the World War II generation did. So it's definitely interesting. Um, my husband does not work in the business at all, but he understands the business. He's a businessman. He's got several businesses himself, and he knows when you have to go, you have to go, and you have to do things because um, it's your job. You have to do them. So he's always been super, super supportive on that. Um, will not being religious impact one career in the death care profession? No. Being closed-minded will. If you can go into, I just did with my student group that I mentor, we talked about the Catholic Church the other day. You need to respect the religion that you are, you are serving a family that they believe, but you don't have to believe it. So when I go into Catholic Church and I bow every time I cross the altar, I'm not bowing to because I am Catholic or because that's my belief. I'm bowing to respect their belief. Just like if it was a Buddhist service and you had to light three sticks of incense, which we've done this in the funeral home, where we've lit three sticks of incense, bowed three times and placed them and kept that going. And we did that because we were respecting the family. I'm not doing it because of their, I'm, I'm acknowledging their God or believing in their God. I'm doing it to respect the family because that's who I'm caring for. And I want them to understand that I am all in to care for them. And I'm all in to care for their loved one because what they believe for their loved one is important to me. But I don't have to believe it. So it, it doesn't matter your religious preference, but you have to be able to do your job and not be closed-minded about it. So that's my two cents on that. Um, can you comment on follow-up support for families after service is complete? Every funeral home is going to be different in their aftercare or what they do. Some send, you know, information to families. Some touch base. Some send thank you cards, um, a one-year anniversary card, or they do a one-year anniversary program or do Christmas programs. It's a huge wide range of what is available and what is done. I would just say sometimes there's funeral homes that do support groups, and they should not be 
doing the spark groups because they don't have somebody trained for that. They have an aftercare coordinator who is not a social worker, who is not a therapist, who is, should not be having a support group. So there's some areas that I think they're, they're, it's not so gray. It's pretty black and white, but people try and act as if it's gray and, and do things they maybe shouldn't be doing. Um, if they have somebody on staff that should run that, great. Totally support it. Um, they make monuments up here in Canada. Hey, Mark. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'm trying to find the next question. Have I thought of teaching? I have thought of it. Um, there, the online schools that I haven't seen any job openings right now, and um, I don't want to move to go to where a mortuary school would be. So I think my way of doing it is through these videos um, to educate and teach the general public. But then I also have a mentoring group I do on Facebook for students and people that are interested. Um, it's really interesting to do that because I feel like this, I love psychology and I feel like this is this kind of a psychology experiment where I'm, I am learning and getting into the minds of consumers for this business and whether it's something I want to hear or not, I am learning so much about this business and what people want and what people hate about the business and it's really, it's really fascinating. Um, do I want to own my own funeral home? Nope, I already answered that one. Do you have business classes? Yeah, mortuary school, you literally take classes in public speaking, business, accounting, chemistry, psychology, English, um, anatomy, chemistry, oh, um, restorative art, um, I'm trying to think what else, finance, you, you name it, there, we take classes, it's such a broad range of classes because you do so many different things within a funeral home that you need to have training towards. After the viewing, let's say day one, after the home has closed, what happens? Nope, they just... Are st they stay where they stay unless you need to use that room again for a funeral the next morning before a next visitation or something this st they stay set up everything stays exactly as is bodies don't go back in the cooler typically because there's no need to once they've been embalmed um the best place to start if you want to work in a funeral home is go to a funeral home and shadow you need to get exposure to what happens behind the scenes when it's not just a funeral day or a visitation day from what you have seen Thanks, Chris, for joining. Um, what do my kids think of my job? I have a whole video on that, Tiffany, um, that I posted just maybe two weeks ago. So you'll have to check that out. Do they serve alcoholic beverages in a funeral home? Sometimes, yes. No severe alcoholic bodies do not cremate differently. Um, the bone may look different afterwards, or the cremated remains may look different. So... It just depends because they're, they're different colors based on what the person died of, the lifestyle they lived, things like that. So, awesome. I'm just making sure I've answered every question because I don't want anybody to, you guys asked several times about Caitlin. <laughs> um, worst thing that's happened during a service Mm. Yeah, aside from fights, things like that, I can't think of anything that's been horrible. Um, no caskets dropped, nothing like that. People <clears throat> talking, or, you know, people getting up during open mic and talking either about themselves or talking way too long. That's one of the worst things that can happen is getting a speaker up there that you want to just make them shut up and sit down. I um, did have a pastor who referred to the um there was an adult female and adult and a child that had died in a car accident and he referred to him as the big dead corpse and the little dead corpse awesome pastor it was horrible honestly that was probably one of the worst um and then i've got one from nathaniel just what to ask later the cooler of the fluid coming out of the deceased family can we hold it in just want to ask what we color of the fluid coming out of a deceased person's body. You've got blood and you've got intestinal brown crap. Essentially, those are the two things that are going to come out. And then urine. Um, you stop getting returned. So you stop getting things coming out. If you're 
aspirating, eventually you stop getting stuff and it's just air because you've already got all of the, um, all of the stuff. Yes, I've handled a funeral for um, multiple family members that have died in car accidents or fires, things like that. Do you work a lot of hours? Being a freelance and trade embalmer, it, you know, there's an ebb and flow. Some weeks I'm busier than others. I don't have a set schedule. Some funeral directors work 100 hours a week, depending on their, if they're on call, if they're running their own business. Um, have you ever been stiffed on a bill? Just like any industry, yes. People blow it off and leave town and just say, screw you. So, but a lot of people think the funeral home should just suck it up and absorb it because we're just money hungry people. Obviously that's what a lot of people say. Um, but yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of bad negative thoughts about the funeral business, which I've, I've seen through the YouTube channel. I keep joking that, um, I want to do a mean tweets or a mean YouTube comments video, kind of like, uh, Jimmy Fallon does where he has the stars read their, their tweets about themselves because some of the things people say in the anonymity of YouTube about the funeral business is amazing. But all right, guys, well, I have to cut this off. I uh, will read through if there's some other questions, I'll hold them and I'll try and do another live video here in a couple weeks. And um, this will post up so you can check the replay. And if you have more questions or if there's any of these questions that you would love to see a full video about, you know, a five to seven minute video about, by all means, post that below so I can then do another video about it. I should have hopefully the water flameless cremation video up in the next two days, which is awesome. So thanks guys. Talk to you soon.